it's our great pleasure to have Martina Wojcicki, a speaker, and Anders Holberg as commentator in today's Spagat lecture. Um, I will say a few words about both the speaker and the commentator, and I will begin with the latter. So um, we all know Anders Holberg, he's Professor Emeritus at Newcastle University. And since uh, uh, 2021, uh, also fellow of the British Academy. Um, he specializes in comparative syntax with uh, concentration on the Scandinavian languages. And um, it should also be mentioned that uh, Anders Holberg is uh, the author of a well-known generalization, which is called Holberg's generalization. <laughs> Um, Martina Wilczko earned her PhD from the University of Vienna in 1995 under the supervision of Edwin Williams and Wolfgang Dressler. From 1996 to 2020, she worked as a postdoc and then as assistant associate and finally full professor at the University of British Columbia. From 2020 until now, she uh, took up a research position at the Catalan Institute for Advanced Studies and Research, or short ICREA, at um, Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona. Um, so a main topic of Martina's work, which is also the topic that is uh, highly, highly relevant for Spagat, is interactional language, or uh, specifically aspects of grammar, which are explained in terms of the fact that language is used uh, by people to, to conduct dialogues. And today's talk will also pertain to dialogues uh, and namely dialogues that people have with themselves, which is a fascinating topic. And uh, I should also mention that Martina is also a field linguist and has published extensively on typological issues from perspective of theoretical linguistics. So um, we thank you very much, Martina, for having agreed to give a talk today as part of the Spagat lecture series. And now the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here, at least uh, virtually. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I mean, this talk is is uh, largely due to Anders because he kind of sparked the uh, sparked uh, a, a, a new generalization about self talk that uh, we, meaning Betsy Ritter, who's also in the audience, and I uh, picked up on, and I'm gonna try and convince you today that looking at self talk is like a really fruitful. Um, avenue of research, and it provides us with a with a nice window into the syntax of speech speech acts. And the syntax of speech acts in, in the last twenty year has gained some momentum, like the syntactization of speech acts. So, um, and I should also say I have a few pictures here, and that artwork is to is due to Quinn Goddard, who is also in the audience and who is who's uh, started to work with us on the on the topic, as you'll see at the end of the talk. So, going back, why should we study uh, self talk? And you know, going back to Plato, um, it is a, it is a common assumption that self talk is sort of a, a conversation that you have with yourself or as Plato says the the soul holds with herself. Um, so it's like and then he's further going on like but the soul when thinking appears to me to be just talking so there is this this connection between thinking talking self talk and so self talk is is kind of like this this limiting case of of talking having conversations and it is a is a window into a lot of things and i'll try and give you you know a detailed analysis of how it's a window into the syntax of speech acts and then a, a more more programmatic um, view on how it's a window into into big picture questions so we all know that it matters who we talk to. Uh, so for example, when I'm uh, in formal talk, and if I were to say, see to Manfred, I would say, Herr Professor Krivka, reden Sie mit sich selbst. 
but in, if we're in an informal type of relation, I can say Manfred redest du mit dir selbst. So it's a first name uh, and du versus title plus last name and C. So there is a change in what elements you find in the sentence. Uh, and that's not just the pronouns and the vocatives, it's also um, in, in my dialect, for example, I have a sentence final particle, which uh, asks for confirmation. So I can say, when I'm formal uh, in a formal relation, so there's an addressee agreement here on the sentence final particle, um, versus an informal talk, it would just be goi, goi. Um, if I'm if my addressee is uh, in an informal relation with me, so there's you know addressee agreement here, which of course we know to be the case in in Basque, which is famous for having a locative agreement. So there is agreement in a in a regular sentence where there is no uh, you uh, there is no second person argument. You still have uh, agreement with the addressee in terms of gender. Uh, and uh, arguably, um, it also matters who you talk to in terms of what the other person knows, or at least what you know the other person knows, and then it affects uh, the, the famous discourse particles of German. So if um, strangers on a plane where, you know, the speaker can't assume any uh, knowledge uh, uh, of the addressee, apart from you know what the weather is like general knowledge uh, they can't assume that the that the that the addressee knows something about the speaker in this context um, uh, i couldn't say they are asking me are you traveling a lot and i can say no i have a dog so i can't i can't leave that easily and if I were to add this particle doch, it would say, you know this. But of course, given that they're a stranger, they can't know it, so I can't use this. But if I say nämlich, you know, ich habe nämlich einen Hund, then it's kind of an explication for the addressee. So, but it differs when I talk to somebody who knows me very well and who knows that I have a dog, then I can use the addressee oriented one, but not that. Uh, speaker, uh, new information one. So this is just to to show that the discourse particles um, are also sensitive to who we're talking to. But in this case, it's not about the gender of the addressee. It is about the knowledge state of the addressee. So all this um, um, uh, all these properties have led people to, and, and others too, have led people to assume that there is an addressee representation above the regular representation of the clause, and it's sensitive to formality, sensitive, can be sensitive to the gender of the addressee, and it can also be sensitive to the knowledge state of the addressee. So the addressee has a syntactic representation. So then the question that becomes interesting is what happens in self-talk? do we still have a representation of an addressee? And that's the question that I want to pursue. And Anders has observed that when people talk to themselves, they can do so either with the use of you or with the use of I. So uh, I can say to myself, I'm such an idiot, or I can say to myself, you're such an idiot. And uh, like I'm going to take this contrast and show that it actually has a different syntactic interpretation. I'm going to argue uh, this is based on work with Betsy uh, that in I centered self talk, we don't have an addressee represented, but in you centered self talk, we do. And so uh, I'm going to show you that this self talk and the properties that uh, it has acts as a window into what the speech act structure is really like and then also as a, as a window, in, window into the relation between language thought and communication, which will be more speculative. So here's the plan. I'm gonna give you uh, a background by way of introducing my own view on what speech act structure, which I don't call speech act structure actually, but I call it interactional structure. And I'm gonna contrast that with the more, I don't know, uh, the, the one that goes back to Ross and has been uh, uh, introduced again by Spice and Tenney. And I'm going to contrast these two and I'm going to try and convince you that the properties of self-talk 
uh, uh, can be more easily accommodated in, in the view that I uh, take the interactional structure. Okay, and then I'm gonna, uh, so I'm gonna show that I-centered self-talk doesn't have an address C and you-centered self-talk has uh, an address C and several properties will follow. And then uh, I won't have time for this. There's a, it's, it's so rich. I, uh, I will try and show you that uh, self-talk doesn't, isn't really about turn-taking. So the, any, the language that uh, regulates turn-taking has to be missing. And then there is more distinctions there as, um, like I can also talk to some generic addressee as opposed to either uh, taking myself as an addressee. And then I'll do some programmatic conclusions and, and advocate for studying self-talk. But okay, we start with the background. Uh, uh, you probably all know, given this venue, um, that Ross introduced the so-called performative hypothesis, which argued that above the regular clause, which here is prices slumped, uh, you have uh, something that it, that uh, encodes directly the elocutional force. So here is I tell you that, and that of course is deleted. So you just spell out the prices slumped. And this was dismissed and then taken up again with the rise of the assumptions that there are functional categories. So now we have in speech and tenny something along the lines of like, the, they call it a speech act, uh, articulated speech act phrase. It, but the insight still is that the speaker gives the utterance to the hearer. So that's the uh, uh, you know a common uh, view of what speech act structure looks like. I have a different uh, view that I um, extensively introduce and discuss in in my recent monograph, the grammar of interactional language, where I argue that it's not about we don't want to call the speech act phrase. It's it's phrases that have a you know a particular function. On the one hand, it's the function of grounding. Uh, and then on the other hand, the function of responding. So grounding regulates uh, the build, the building of common ground, and responding regulates the the turn taking mechanism. So in particular, there is an articulated grounding layer, and crucially, I have the speaker ground lower than the address C ground. So the speaker ground will say how I relate to the pr proposition. Do I know it? Do I not know it? And then uh, the address C ground will talk about how I think you relate to the proposition. Do I think you know it? Do I think you don't know it? And I have my the architecture that I used in, in my universal spine hypothesis that every head comes with a coincidence feature and says uh, the complement is in or does or does not coincide with the abstract argument in the spec specifier. So for example, uh, you can, uh, you can have a particle that says what I'm saying is or is not in your ground. It's old or new information to you or unknown to you. Um, and so that's what I'm assuming. And then for the response layer, um, uh, you can think of it as, as I'm uh, regulating what uh, uh, Farkas and Bruce call the table, right? regulating what we put on the table and we, what we take off the table. I call it the response set. So um, in, in an initiating move, it would be addressee oriented in that I, I can say, okay, what I'm saying, I'm putting it in your response set. I'm putting it in on your table. So please respond now. And in a reacting move, it's speaker oriented in the sense that uh, I can mark whether an utterance is a response. So I can say what I'm saying is in my response set, or what I'm saying is not in my response that I'm, you know, for some reason I'm not responding to what you just said because I have to elaborate on something. But it's again the same architecture. Okay, so that's the the snapshot of 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 this framework, the interactional spine. And so if we compare the interactional spine hypothesis with the performative hypothesis, we see three crucial differences. In the interactional spine hypothesis, uh, uh, I, I assume that we're regulating linguistic interaction versus in the performative hypothesis, you're regulating speech acts. 
crucially for media addressee is higher than the speaker versus in the performative hypothesis, it's the other way around. The speaker is higher than the addressee. And in the interactional spine hypoth hypothesis, we're dealing with interactional roles, ground holders and turn holders. Whereas in, this, in, the, in the performative hypothesis, we're dealing with speech act roles, the speaker and the addressee. Okay. And what I'm going to argue now is that the properties of self-talk favor the, interna uh, the interactional spine hypothesis. Okay, so let's get started. Two types of self-talk. Already introduced it. Anders' uh, observation, or that he, you know, he made that prominent, um, is that you can, when you talk to yourself, you can either talk to about yourself with I or with you. So I'm an idiot, or you an idiot. And um, first step, I'm going to try and convince you now that I centered self talk does not have an address present, but you centered self talk does. Okay, so in other words, you can think of I centered self talk as, a, as, as thinking out loud, there is no address C, whereas you centered self talk is a conversation that you really have with yourself. So the self is both the speaker and the address C. Okay, so the uh, striking empirical difference is that when you, you know, we know that when you so bet, suppose that Betsy talks to me, she could say, Martina, you're an idiot, uh, or she could tell me about herself, Martina, I'm an idiot. In self-talk, however, uh, uh, if I talk to myself, I can say, Martina, you're an idiot, but it sounds really strange if I say, Martina, I'm an idiot. That sounds really strange. That's, that's um, in a paper that Betsy and I, it's about to appear. Okay, so this follows, if we assume that vocatives are uh, generated in the addressee position, this is the natural habitat, you know, it names the addressee, and that's why uh, a third person form, like a name, can be used as a form of address. It's not a second, suddenly a second person. It becomes the addressee because it's in the position of the addressee role. Um, and in I centered self talk, we're simply lacking that position. So vocatives are not licensed. So it's a structural, it's a structural um, um, property. Second uh, property, similar uh, rationale, uh, imperatives are not possible in I-centered self-talk. So uh, you can say to somebody else, stop putting yourself down or stop putting me down. But in self-talk, you can't say, okay, you can say, stop putting yourself down. Martina, stop putting yourself down. But it's weird, or you can't say, stop putting me down. That sounds like, uh, you know, you know, you, you, you have a pathology. That's like, you think you're two people. And the, there's another example, we can skip it. Um, um, again, uh, this follows if we assume that in an imperative, you necessarily need to have this address zero represented above the clause. And that's the, the, the interactional argument, which, binds the, the silent subject that you get in imperatives. And if in I-centered self-talk, this position is missing, then there is nothing to bind the silent argument of the imperative and imperatives are no longer uh, well-formed. Okay, so um, now, oops, what is that? Let's see. Okay, I, I, I just, um, wanted to, to point out that, you know, if you try and think, okay, let's assume we don't have any interactional structure, any speech structure, we just have our regular S class. Can we explain uh, these two facts that uh, vocatives and imperatives are not possible in I-centered self-talk? And it's, it's, it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all the, the points here, but, uh, you can try it for yourself. It's really hard to explain it when you when you when you're dealing with self talk because you're talking to yourself. So the speaker and the addressee are the same person. So why 
should that hold that you can't have vocatives and imperatives uh, in, in, in one, but not in the other. So I, th I think it really is uh, evidence for the presence of an address C role. And so now, um, but in, in both accounts, in both the interactional spine hypothesis and in the uh, uh, performative hypothesis, you, you can explain this because in both cases you have a, a dedicated um, addressee or hero role, and so it's okay. So, you know, for that, nothing would speak for one or the other. So the next question that we then have, is there evidence for a speaker role? Do we have... Uh, uh, evidence for that? And I think the answer is yes, oh, again, from speech talk. And the evidence here comes from discourse markers. And I'm going to introduce uh, uh, discourse markers that have not been talked about as far as I know in the literature. And they're from my dialect, but I think they, you, I don't know whether you have them in, in Berlin. But there is a difference between, um, so the, the basic sentence is Lena has a new dog. And then I can preface the sentence with a ge. Ge, die Lena hat einen neuen Hund. Um, that would mean something like, uh, 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 what what are you saying like uh is it really it's like a discrepancy between the the speaker and the address i'm going to give you more examples uh in a sense in a bit that'll get more clear what it what it does versus the ma indicates surprise so that's speak, speaker oriented um and there is um we've already seen the doch which is addressee oriented uh, and there is a, another particle leicht, which is again speaker oriented. It indicates indicates some kind of surprise. So let's let's get through the example in more detail, showing you that um, ma encodes surprise. So here, the context is that two people are on a walk, and from a distance they see their friend Lena, who is walking with a dog they have never seen before. So they are surprised. Um, and in this context, it's weird to just utter the sentence without any marker. So, but it's, you can't add the ge, which is the addressee oriented one. It would mean like, oh, you think she, she doesn't have a dog, or it would be some contradiction with the addressee, but the ma and the leicht are uh, possible. And the discrepancy um, uh, uh, one, the, the gay particle is okay if somebody says to me, Maybe Lena wants a new dog from us, one of our new, uh, little puppies. And now the, the, the felicitous utterance would be ge, de Lena hat a neichen Hund. Ge is kind of saying, what are you saying? Like, you're wrong. Uh, and the dog here also would, would say, well, you should know that. Okay, so there's this addressee orientation. And in this context, it's not okay to say ma or leicht because there's no surprise. Uh, and so the assumption would be that the, the addressee oriented discourse markers are in an, you know, associated with an addressee role and the uh, speaker oriented one are associated with the, with the speaker role. They're not really like, especially these, these sentence peripheral particles, they're outside of the propositional clause. And so they want this outside position. And for um, you, you know, the implementation would be that ge says it's not in your ground, so you know it's you're you're wrong. You, yeah. And ma would say it's not in my ground. Like I'm surprised about this. Okay. And the doch and the leicht have to sort of uh, you know enter into an agreement relation with the with the higher structure to to get at the um, addressee and speaker orientation. But the point that I want to make is that uh, we do in self-talk, uh, we can use uh, ma both in I-centered and in U-centered self-talk. So you can, you know, I just found out I won the lottery, then I can say ma, I hope gewonnen, ma, I won, or I hope leicht gewonnen, like I'm surprised about this, and they can also co-occur. And I can also say that to myself in, in U-centered self-talk. Okay, Madu uh, so it's all good. Uh, 
And you, you might ask, okay, why do, why do you express surprise to yourself? I think it's used to make it a fact for yourself to like commit yourself to this. Now, okay, this is in my ground now. Now, as you might expect now, given, given how this talk is going, um, uh, the addressy oriented particles are not possible in eye-centered self-talk. So if I say uh, to myself, gay, I've been food spotted, gay, I'm too, like, suppose I, 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 I see somebody doing something that's really um, requires skill. Uh, and I wonder to myself, oh, should I do that? And then I, I, I decide, no, I'm too clumsy for that. Um, I, I can say to myself, get a bit food spotted but I cannot say to myself, gay okay, ibn food spotted, and the same with doch and the co-occurrence. So uh, the gay and doch, which are the addressee oriented ones are not licensed in eye-centered self-talk versus ma and leicht uh, are licensed in both types of self-talk. And so uh, we can conclude two things. First, we have more evidence that eye-centered self-talk does not contain an addressee. And second, that uh, in both cases, eye-centered and you-centered self-talk, we do have uh, a speaker also represented, okay? Um, so I hope that I've convinced you now that eye-centered self-talk really is, is structurally deficient in the sense of it lacks an address zero, which you-centered self-talk has. Uh, and we can, um, there's two conclusions that we can draw here. One is um, that it really, it should be about the ground and not about the speaker and addressee, given that the these particles, for example, are talking about the, the epistemic states of the speaker and the addressee. And the second um, uh, conclusion that we can draw is, um, uh, I, well, it's, it's, it's about the structural deficiency. I'm oh gonna go there. If we assume that the addressee is higher than the speaker, then we can just say, okay, in eye-centered self-talk, we just don't project higher up. And in you centered self-talk is, 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 is you know, the more, uh, more complete interactional structure. If it was the other way around, then we would have to take out uh, a, a, uh, a, a position that, uh, you know, that you'd expect to be there. So it's not simply a matter of structural deficiency. You'd have to kind of cut out something from the middle. And, you know, uh, there are people, for example, Susie Wurmbrand have argued that you can't do that. You can't just take away something from the middle. If you're growing up to the addressee, then you have to include the speaker. So if we assume that the addressee is higher than the speaker, we can. There is a. It, it follows straightforwardly that uh, the the uh, the eye centered self talk is, is structurally deficient. Okay. okay, so we have now two arguments. Like these two properties speak uh, to the, um, uh, the you know favor the the interactional spine hypothesis over the performative hypothesis. I'm not saying that you couldn't do it in the performative hypothesis. I think it's just more straightforward in the interactional spine. Okay. And, um, you know, going back to Hol Holmberg's paper on, on where he introduces this generalization, he talks about, he has a different analysis, but one that's compatible with saying that we are dealing with the 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 mind the, the ground the epistemic state of the interlocutor like he assumes that there is um, okay he has a feature bundle which denotes the consciousness or mind of the the speaker so he introduces a my mind feature to get at some of the properties that will um, uh, uh, come out later and you know and on this analysis that the speaker representation is really a representation of ground and not of the speaker role itself, 
um, captures this immediately. Now, the speaker role is, is indirectly introduced because the speaker is the holder of the ground. It's like a, an, an inalienable possession relation. So the speaker is present, but through the representation of uh, their ground. Okay, and so now we're we're getting to more evidence for this grounding uh, 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 role that that we have here, uh, which is a, another difference between the two types of self talk that um, Anders discusses, namely that. And here we have one where the, the you-centered self-talk is, is more restricted in that you can't say to yourself, you can't believe your luck. That sounds strange, like, you know, you're two people, but I can't believe my luck is fine. And um, Andrew says that you can't refer to the self as an experience of feelings or holder of intentions or plans either, generalizing. You can't refer to the self in assertions about the self state of mind, only I can. So I, I, I don't have access into, into your, the addressee's mental state. And he analyzes uh, this as, as, uh, as uh, saying that there is a mindless self. The addressee is represented as a mindless self. And um, uh, what, you know, if, we, if we're going again through the differences here, like, uh, as I said, we have, um, a difference in, in you centered self talk. And on, the, on our analysis here, we couldn't have this structurally conditioned because you know everything's there. So the assumption is that it really is about the, the representation of the ground. And in, on independent grounds, you know, it, it makes sense to say that the speaker ground re really represents the self's knowledge state and I have access to it because it's my knowledge state. But the minute you have an address C, you're representing their knowledge state as something that you can only make assumptions about, but you can't look into that. It's it's the other interlocutor. And it's like, uh, it's not that they're mindless, it's that they're not accessible to, because I can only access my own mind. And whatever you put into this addressee uh, position will be inaccessible. And it doesn't matter if in the real world, it's me. If I talk to myself, if I treat myself as the addressee, grammar says, okay, no more access. Okay. So in a way then uh, the you centered self-talk behaves like other centered uh, uh, talk. So a regular conversation, it doesn't matter uh, whether it's, it's um, um, the, the, the address seek ground is there both in you centered self-talk and in other centered self-talk and the address will always be treated as an inaccessible mind. Okay. okay, so how am I doing for time? It's about 10 minutes. Okay. Still. Just wanted to I have, I, I have 10 minutes left. Yes. Y yes or no? Yes. Yes, we start with Okay, you. perfect. Okay, so now um, switching gears a little bit, let's think about, so we've, we've I think I'm, I've convinced myself that, you know, we're better off in interactional spine hypothesis relative to addressees higher than speaker and then we're dealing with the grounding um, our role. Now we have still two things to go. What is, is it about regulating linguistic interaction or is it about regulating speech acts? And then the other is about turn holders. Uh, okay, so we'll go to the linguistic interactions first. And so let's ask what happens uh, in different speech acts, in different, um, um, you know, really, so here I'm gonna uh, do a little bit of a shortcut and, and talk about clause type as if there were speech acts because that's that's a little bit what, not a little bit, that's what Ross and, and then Spies and Tenny in, in Ross's uh, um, uh, footsteps have done. So in a declarative clause and uh, which, you know, is, an assertion and under you know, normal mappings, Ross's point was that the assertion part, the elocutionary force is encoded in that speech act structure. In that is I'm telling you, that's the assertion part. And the same, uh, you know, um, 
uh, Spies and Tenney argue for the same thing. It's like, okay, it's encoded. The illocutionary force is the speaker gives the utterance content to the hearer. Now in self-talk, I can make assertions. I can say to myself, like, I mean, I can use a declarative process. I can say to myself, I really live in Barcelona now, or you really live in Barcelona now, or I can do it, you can do it. Like, I did it, you did it. So you can, you can do that in self-talk. So given that we can have eye-centered self-talk with an assertion, that means we don't have to, even if, if I'm right what I've said up until now, that means we don't have to have an addressee to, to say, to have a declarative thought, you know, uh, and uh, then you could ask, okay, why would, why would we use a declarative or an assertion in self-talk? Because on classic assumptions, an assertion is used when the speaker knows, the addressee doesn't know, the speaker wants the addressee to know, but if the speaker is the addressee, why would you bother? And um, this is something that uh, uh, Gertz has, has worked on, and he says that this is only a problem, uh, well, the problem being that why, why do you do a declarative or an assertion uh, in self-talk? And he says, is this only a, a problem if we assume that um, the, the, uh, the purpose of communication is information exchange? And if that's the case, then self-talk would be redundant because you know I have one mind, and so why why is that? Would there be an exchange of information? But he says communication is really about expressing commitments, and so uh, self-talk is really a form of making a commitment to yourself. Like uh, like you know the example is like you can do it. It's like I'm committing myself to the belief that I can do it. That's that's the point. And uh, similarly, in um, a, so in a question, you could ask yourself, okay, well, Ross would say that there is an interrogative feature in the in the verb of communication here. So it'd be like, I ask you, did prices slump? And for uh, Spies and Tenney, there was a movement of the hearer uh, to a position above the utterance content that you get in 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 interrogatives. I, I'm not worried about the details here. I'm just, uh, I'm just, you know, want to point out that in both these approaches, questions necessarily have that addressee role there. And uh, if we then go to self-talk, we observe that I can ask myself a question even in eye-centered self-talk. So I can say, "Do I want to do this? Or will I be able to do this?" What can I do now? It all sounds perfectly uh, well formed. I sent it self talks, and then again, like okay, why would you have a a, a question to yourself? Like it's just one mind. Why would you ask yourself? But and and again, I, I, I given what I said so far, we'd have to conclude that given that it's I sent it self talk, there is no addressee. And so there's only a speaker. And so the point that I want to make is that it really is just an interrogative and you can have an interrogative thought for yourself. That's, that's all. And you know, there's some literature on, on that interrogative attitudes are a thing. So it's not just a, a speech act. It's, it's, an, you know, it's an interrogative, uh, it's an attitude. And so again, uh, um, uh, Gertz's analysis of speech acts, not in terms of communication, uh, of information exchange, but in terms of commitment, um, uh, uh, help us understand why we would ask ourselves a question. It's a way to getting myself to, um, to, 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 I want myself to now commit, my, commit. So I, I'm asking myself, and that's a way of, of forcing myself to, to, to form a commitment. So the point I just wanted to make was that the neo-performative hypothesis is a way of regulating speech acts, but that's not really uh, what, uh, you know, the, the examples I gave you, that we don't need to have an addressee role present uh, in just uh, for asking a question. Uh, 
what I'm arguing in the interactional spine hypothesis that is that that higher structure is there to regulate interaction, and and that's uh, that's uh, you know uh, I can use questions to interact, but I can also use questions just to have a thought. Okay, and then finally, turn holders. Do we find evidence for uh, whether you know for that from from um, uh, uh, in in self talk, and remember in the beginning I told you my view on on uh, interactional structure that there is a response layer, and there is an address oriented one. Like I I tell you, okay, I'm I, what I'm saying. I give this to you now into your response set. I want you to response, or I can mark my utterance as a response. And there is uh, some evidence, and you know that we need to do more research on this. But it seems to me that in self talk. Uh, a rising in like questions can be uttered either with a rising intonation or with a falling intonation. What are you doing versus what are you doing? And in, in, in regular speech, this is actually more common to use the falling intonation. And it seems to me that um, in both cases of self-talk, you-centered and I-centered self-talk, it is strange to say, what am I doing? Or what are you doing? So that, if that's true empirically, and um, then we would uh, we would have evidence that in self-talk this layer is missing. You can't have rising intonation. Now you could ask me, okay, but what, what about falling intonation? So I, I assume that rising, I've independently argued, I should say that that rising intonation is associated with the response layer. It's, a, it's like an intonational tune that is like a morpheme and it's up in this layer. And then you could ask, okay, but you know, what about falling intonation? And I assume that falling intonation is not an intonational tune. It's simply the effect of uh, what happens when we, when we talk, pitch declines automatically because uh, the pressure declines. So it's not having falling intonation is not dependent on the presence of the response layer. Okay. And the, the conversely, well seems to as a as an initial marker seems to mark that um, uh, the what I'm saying is a response, even though it doesn't look like it. So if I say, why aren't you going to skydive with the others? Uh, I say, well, I'm too old for that. Um, um, uh, uh, why am I not invited? Okay. I, I, well, I. I'm running out of time here. So I um, well marks the response at uh, the the utterance as a response, and it seems strange to me to use well in in self talk. So if I look at a group of uh, skydivers and I and I um, ask myself in my mind, should I do this? And then it's weird for me. Well, uh, you're too old for that. Or well, I'm too old for that. Sounds strange to me to use well in self-talk. So if that's the case, then we have this typology of modes of talking that only in conversation with others do we have the whole structure, including the response layer. In a conversation with oneself, which is you-centered self-talk, you have the address here and the speaker uh, representation. And if I'm thinking out loud, you have the speaker representation. Okay, so I think I'm happy about this because the interactional spine hypothesis, I think, can account for all of these properties that I've just discussed. And I think I'm pretty done now with my, well, how much do you have time? Four minutes, just. Okay. <laughs> okay, so very briefly as wrapping up and I'm gonna skip a whole bunch. Um, and then like you might ask, okay, what happens to this nice, nice insight that Ross and Spice and Tenny have where it's like the, the speech act structure into, uh, you know, um, in, uh, in codes, I give the, the, the sentence to you. I tell you that as, well, I think, and, and that's, that, that's the, the insight that leads to say that the speaker is higher than the addressee. But now I'm saying the addressee is higher than the speaker. And so I think we can think of this as, as what you know relative to what I know, know 
causes me to say is. And I think that, you know, you can think about it. it um, uh, I think that captures really nicely the, the role of conversation. It's a way to also capture what's going on in self-talk. And I'm going to skip a whole lot because now, you know, it, it, there's, there's way more going on in terms of what, how many types of self-talk there are. You know, the difference between I-centered and you-centered self-talk is really just two aspects. And then, you know, there's more which we can predict from this typology. But I want to briefly say that what we've learned from self-talk is interesting in the, in the, in light of the, uh, on the one hand, in light of the discussion of what is language for? Is it for thought or is it for communication? That's an ancient debate. Now, given that there is interactional structure and I think self-talk is, you know, is a new window into it and it really gives, gives more meat to like, okay, we really need to represent this. Uh, if say UG contains interactional structure, that means that communication is built into the language system. So we can't have this dichotomy. Rather, what I what I like to say is that language really mediates between thought and communication. So, so you can't just let communication out of the picture because it's it's part of the structure and um well i'm gonna i have a lot more to say but i stop here thank you so our our commentary is by Anders schoenberg you can start do you have to share something or um no, I have nothing to share. I okay. mean, a screen to share. Not in this sense. Yeah. I'm not that well organized. Your thoughts. Yeah, so we'll, we'll try and manage. Um, right, so, so um, um, you know, obviously I, I think this is really, really, really interesting, really nice. I'm very pleased that, that you, Martina and, and, and Betsy have taken, taken this up and, you know, developed it in such, a, you know, such an interesting and clever, clever fashion. So I don't, um, I don't know, I don't have a lot of, I don't really have any critique, I would say, but there are, you know, so I'm going to actually talk about some things that you didn't, no, at least in part, things that you didn't take up in your talk at all. So I, what I, what I like about this is, is how you, you, you show that these, um, I mean, the, 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 that the, um, how self-talk are these, um, uh, two types of self-talk and so on, that, that, that they actually can be, the conditions on self-talk can be explained in structural terms. Uh, and and uh, I think very strong arguments that, that the addressee, the representation of the addressee in the, uh, you know, in the broad syntactic uh, uh, structure, um, that it's uh, representation of the addressee is higher than the representation of, of the speaker in this, extended C domain, I think you have, and there are good arguments for that. Uh, and um, I mean, there's the, this basic insight that you have, uh, that there is use of language, which doesn't involve any addressee, right? Incontestable fact, right? So actually having, that's when you think, yeah, verbally. Uh, so when you so having an addressee is actually adding something to this uh, thinking, and of course adding something when you add more structure in uh, add something, it, you know means adding a new layer of you know like a new head, a new layer of, of structure, which fits with with how we think of syntactic structure uh, as you know being built by by merge. So, um, so that is, uh, and 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 I uh, I love those the arguments from from those uh, discourse particles. Uh, I think it was, it was some very nice arguments there. Although you know the discourse particles are a bit odd in themselves, but I mean if you if you just uh, have to just believe you that 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 this is what they mean. Uh, and I'm sure, by the way, that there are corresponding 
probably corresponding particles or sort of uh, there are expressions in other languages, including probably Swedish and, and Finnish and so on, uh, that have those same properties. Okay, but I, I, I wanna take up something that, that you didn't mention at all, and because you only had 45 minutes. Um, and that is uh, the, the fact that not all people use self-talk, right? Um, in, my, in my experience, right, I've asked my students, I've asked people, um, when I've given talks about this, I've asked people in the audience. Uh, so in my experience, uh, there is a minority of people who don't use self-talk, this type of self-talk, right? Um, uh, saying, you know, you're an idiot and so on. Uh, uh, so about 20% or perhaps less, like between 10 and 20%, um, they don't do this at all, right? I have uh, some direct experience of this because my wife doesn't, right? It's not only she doesn't use it, but she doesn't speak like this, but she thinks it's like demented. That, you know, why would you talk to yourself? You know, calling yourself you, and that's like, uh, um, uh, it's completely out of the question, right? Uh, uh, now, this is a very interesting, you know, it's variation in, you know, it's linguistic variation. But it's a it's a it's a special type of linguistic variation, right? It's not, of course, it's not like sort of dialectal variation or uh, social variation, and it's not um, it's not cultural variation either, right? I mean, let's say there are people who there are people who swear and other people who don't swear, right? Well, that's a cultural cultural variation. Uh, depending on your upbringing and, and, and things like that, but I don't think this is. So I think um, I've, I've um, uh, my son uh, also doesn't use it, right? And but my daughter does. So uh, which I think shows that this isn't this isn't to do with you know input and anyway input. You don't have a lot of input. You don't sort of learn. You don't learn self talk by listening to other people because. Or at least because you don't hear much self-talk because you know by definition it's it's a sort of private thing that you do on your own. I guess you can hear it sometimes, but but it's uh, so so it's just uh, uh, that I think this variation is it's it's uh, it's to do with it's a personality thing, basically probably I mean basically biological I think. So I think that is it's uh, I think it would be interesting to study. So what do you think about this? Have you thought about this at all? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Um, uh, so there's a few things to say. So one in, uh, in the literature on, on inner speech, which is sort of the psychologists uh, take on this phenomenon, um, uh, they distinguish a whole range of different types of inner speech. And it starts with, maybe I share, um, Screen again. I have I have a model. Oops. Um, so they they there is this. Um, you have a goal um, and it's it's language. And the, the first thing is what they call conceptualization. So it's kind of like, it's also called uh, pre-symbolic thought. It's like when you have a vague thought and then when you start making it more explicit, more explicit, then you start adding words. You even think about the phonemes it's up to the, to the particular uh, type of you know, sound that you're making. So I suspect what what we what we find here is that people use different types of this inner speech, and you know, like the 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 when we start calling it self talk, that might be a cutoff point. Maybe it's you know, like maybe they're not formulating it in in the same way. So that's that's one thing, and I think we do need a a model, and you know, like I I think you know, with what I've presented here, you know, we're on the way of developing such a model for this continuum between like this pre-language pre, pre -language vague symbolic 
uh, asymbolic thought towards like really having a sentence in your head and then you know maybe pronouncing it out loud. Uh, so we need a typology for that, which I think you know I have you know we have a new angle to do that, and and so the and the type of variation that you talk about is really fascinating because I think as linguists, we have been focusing on language variation and what's the difference between Italian and English and what's the difference maybe like socio, so, sociolinguistic variation. There's less than uh, in, so for example, neurodiverse populations. So the language of schizophrenia, the language of autism, the language of, you know, also, you know, and I'm involved in a project with Wolfram Hinson on that, where the variation is a, of a different type and we need to study that. And, you know, like the, the kind, the, this kinds of like, how do people think is, is in that, is in that, in that range that that uh, we haven't tapped into, but it's a really interesting new window into the relation between language and thought, and the the uh, the what variation can look like. And just one more thing, like you said, it might be it might be biological this difference. I just read you know, the, the, the title of a paper that seemed to say of in a psych, in the psychology uh, tradition on, on in a speech that seemed to suggest that it might have to do with whether, or it might be correlate with whether people as child, as children had a, a imaginary friend or like talking to teddy bears, mm -hmm. that might be a developmental, um, you know, setting that uh, might influence that, but uh, that's something I, you know, I have, I have just scratched, there's so much literature on, on inner speech and I've just scratched the surface, but it's, it's, it's so rich and, you know, it, it leads us also to this, how do you study this? You know, you ask people and uh, for their judgment. So that's, it's methodologically, I, you know, I have had prepared a few slides on methodology, but um, it is is fascinating, but it's not 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 easy to study. So, do you know how your wife how your wife like? I mean, she obviously thinks, right? So, yes, she so, does. so what's the difference? <laughs> she has a PhD. So, she... <laughs> right? so what's yeah. the difference between like when do you call something thinking and when do you call something you know talking to yourself? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a. Uh, uh, so she she would say that if so asked so so what about don't you sort of okay so you don't say you you know do this or or you know you're an idiot or something or or you can do it but but so how about using I as a pronoun uh, she's not, not really doing that either I mean she she says if if she does it it's sort of as if there is uh, an addressee yeah. um, present so in that kind of as a kind of I don't know staged uh, context or mm. something where you you know speak uh, I don't know preparing something that you want to say or something so so it's um it's a striking difference I was very struck by this when 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 hearing this from her and then had it you know had it confirmed from from, from that that there are other people who 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 speak like that or who you know uh, so I was thinking could it I mean uh, in in your terms I mean in your uh, interactional spine uh, would it be could could we say that for these people um, that they don't have they don't have a uh, if there is an address C uh, you know level there if there is an address C uh, ground present that is if they're not just thinking uh, uh, verbally, then uh, then there's always a response layer, right? So yeah. the, the sort of the response layer is always there. Yeah, and that would be the in in those in your in terms of your tree there that that would be the yeah. difference. Yeah. Yeah. When you were just talking about how she like she says when when you use I, she still has the addressee. So then it occurred to me that it's possible to say you know in this structure that okay, like there's people who just uh, can't do the, the, the pruning off bit by bit. So either the whole interactional structure is there or not. And it kind of makes sense because like you said, we are not 
as children, we don't get input for self-talk. Apparently self-talk happens as an internalization of other oriented talk. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that kind of parameter setting environment that really lends itself to fixing our, what we're doing in self-talk. So everybody's kind of on their own that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now, another thing, uh, yeah. another thing I would like to take up, if, if, I'm, sure. if I may, yeah, um, is I will um, talk a little bit more about the um, uh, about the difference between I centered and you centered self talk, yeah, and and this and this condition that you can't talk about, you can't express your feelings or intentions and so on by using you-centered self-talk. Uh, you know, so so um, so the way I, I, I like to put this is is uh, uh, how you can you can say you can tell yourself uh, I'm so fed up with you, right? I'm so fed up with you. I, that's something I've told myself many times, right? In Swedish, uh, uh, but I can't say you're so fed up with me. Yourself, I'm I'm so fed up with you, yes, and I and you are uh, the same person, right? Me, uh, but I can't say you're so fed up with me, uh, even though you know. So why not, right? Yeah. Um, uh, to start with, actually, this uh, uh, sort of a question of definition there. Um, when I say I'm so fed up with you, is that I centered or are you centered? Self talk. I think the minute you have a you, it would be you-centered self -talk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would have to be, yeah. 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 Which I think fits with, uh, actually, when, you know, when, you know, when checking with um, imperatives or, uh, well, not, not with imperatives, but checking with vocatives yeah. and so on. Yeah. Behaves like yeah. you-centered. Um, but, um, yeah, well, so you... Uh, So I, I, I in, in that paper, I talked about this in terms of saying that I can't access, uh, you know, the, 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 that the addressee in self-talk doesn't have, is a mindless speaker. And I guess that I, it's sort of a cool idea in a way, but of course I, I definitely agree with, with you when you say that it's, it's, um, it's to do with access, right? So you don't have access to, uh, you don't have access to the, uh, addressee's uh, mind, right? Um, but that is, uh, but that's remarkable, actually. Uh, you don't have uh, uh, access. To, so, so you're saying that, that it's, um, uh, that obviously when you're speaking to somebody, you don't have access to their mind. So you can't like, you know, express their feelings. Uh, um, and 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 you're, uh, one of the slides that you said you you said that the grammar doesn't sort of make any difference. Right. So the grammar uh, doesn't care if it's right. a real addressee or if it's the yes. you, know, you uh, yourself as addressee. Yeah. But it's it's and somehow yeah, but it's that's quite remarkable that that is the case because I mean you, um, uh, you. I mean, you can refer to yourself as you, okay? Uh, but you do have, and you do have access to your own mind in the sense that I know what I'm thinking, right? Yeah. So I do have access to it uh, in that way, but I can't express it using you as yeah. uh, as as a right. as subject, right? Yeah. So it's so it's not just uh, it's not uh, you know so easy that oh well, grammar doesn't care. Yes, grammar doesn't care, but that's that's that's. Strange that that is the case. It's it's, yes. it's linguistic. Uh, yes. It's like universal grammar somehow doesn't allow me to express that, even though I know my mind, I know what I'm thinking, but I can't express it like it sounds very. It's kind of it sort of can't mean that when you when you say yeah. you're so fed up with me. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think it's remarkable, and I think it's a, it's a remarkable evidence that we have this addressee role represented. And then if I talk to myself and treat myself an, as an addressee, 
it takes on that role no matter what. It's kind of the same as das Mädchen, uh, the girl, it's diminutive, it's neuter, and it doesn't matter that we're talking about a female individual, grammar wins. And in the same vein, I think, again, grammar, grammar wins, it's that, and I think it would be much harder to explain if we didn't have that addressee role there that just has this property of, you know, accessible to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Still, I mean, you, I mean, comparing again, speaking to others and speaking to yourself, right? Um, I mean, you can uh, you can say to someone else, right? You can say, "You're so fed up with me," right? I and mean, that's uh, you know, it's a statement about their what I think. It's it's based on my assumptions about their state of mind. Yeah. So um, so why can't I do that with myself then? That, I mean, that, you know, just... It's just a descriptive statement. Yeah, so it, it's like, it's almost like it's pragmatically odd. Like, pragmatically, I know that I'm talking to myself. So if I say to you, uh, you're so fed up with me, I'm like, given all I, or like, you must be so fed up with me, right? That's more because it, I have, you know, I can only infer that. I don't look into your mind. So then I like given all the circumstances, I infer that. And so it's it's felicitous to say that to you, but it seems it's, you know, I'm I don't know whether that's that's right, but that would be the word, way I would try and explain this difference between talking to you and it's okay to say versus talking to me and it's weirder that it's weirder to say something to me where I where I have to admit that I made some inferences from my behavior then it becomes it becomes more schizophrenic in a way because then I have to treat myself as like you know obviously pragmatically I know that I'm talking to myself it's just that the grammar you know treats it in a particular way and that so that difference between other oriented and self oriented you're you're so fed up with me might be pragmatically conditioned but that's an empirical question it's an interest it's an interesting question and again like we need to do more like work on like what people are actually like you know more field work on how people are actually talking to themselves so how about seeing it like this, that you, um, I mean, when I say to someone else, you're so fed up with me, or, or you know, you must be fed up with me, uh, or when I make any any sort of uh, statement about the world to an addressee, I'm adding something to the common ground, right? Um, um, I'm adding propositions, or a proposition to the common ground. But when I'm talking to myself, there is no common ground, right? Because I know this already. So it's not so so uh, so that that is why saying to myself you're so fed up with me as as a sort of descriptive statement uh, is sort of uh, you know totally infelicitous or you know it sounds completely odd because when speaking to yourself you're not adding any propositions to any common ground but it's then it, but, then, but then it's it's not it's clear shared me. yeah but then it's not clear to me how how you get the difference between the the cognitive like the you're so fed up with me versus you can do it like that you know like how i how, uh, i mentioned gertz's work on on that it's not about information exchange it's about commitments and I don't quite see the difference between the uh, between the you're so fed up with me versus you can do it in that in that you can do it isn't a descriptive. It's uh, I mean I think uh, somehow it seems to me that it's it's a special it's a special kind of speech act mm -hmm. that we're uh, we're dealing with a special type of speech act. You're expressing uh, expressing your own um, feelings and intentions, which uh, have those special properties. Mm. Anyway, Gertz is that, I, just, I mean, when you say, when I'm telling myself you're an idiot or I'm an idiot, what, 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 what commitments am I making there? It doesn't seem to be the right way to talk about. I know, it's, it's the- Self-talk in general. <laughs> yeah. 
this type of self talk. That's I mean he has Gertz has this general uh, theory of 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 commitment, uh, and he he he's, he has one paper where he says it's a better way to 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 dealing with speech act thinking about uh, uh, than thinking about talking as information exchange because now he says you know i can i can handle i can handle um self talk better than traditional analysis but yeah mm -hmm.